Hello, alright, you're listening to the Gritty Bowman, home of gritty bow hunting films, interviews, tall tales, and a wee bit of manly boasting. I'm South Cox, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. <laughs> <laughs> this week on the Gritty Bowman, we travel to Fortuna, California to talk to South Cox, boyer and owner of Stalker Stick Bows and spot and stock mule deer hunter extraordinaire. In 1989, South's first bow hunting article was published, spawning a writing career that has him published in half a dozen different archery magazines, including Eastman's Bow Hunting Journal, where South has been a field editor for years. Between writing and bow building, South is fully immersed in the hunting industry. South is a genuine craftsman. Stalker stick bows are so stunning that I want one just to hang on my wall as a work of art. And at the same time, a stalker bow is a durable, functional hunting weapon, as South has proven year after year by slaying monster muleys. In this podcast, we talk about high country mule deer hunting, what it takes to kill a monster mule deer with a bow, and how South does it. Due to my amateur video audio podcasting skills and the audio nightmares I've had with this podcast, I have not been able to finish editing the entire podcast. So I have split the podcast into three parts. In part two and three, you'll hear about South's Grow With Your Bow program, the weasel bow, the future of the hunting industry, and the effects of a divided hunting community. If you like the show, please go to our website at grittybowman.com and subscribe to this podcast and tell your mates and pals about us. Do us a favor and please take a moment to leave us a rating or a review on iTunes or on our YouTube channel. Send your questions and podcast ideas to grittybowman at gmail.com. If you're listening to this on iTunes, you can see the video version of this podcast on our website at www.grittybowman.com. <laughs> right. Counterfeit water is what it should say. <laughs> no. All right. Well, let's get started. Okay. We are um, here, the Gritty Bowmen are here in California with South Cox, uh, owner of Stalker Stick Bows. And we're in your shop uh, here in Fortuna. Yep. Um, um, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit, tell, tell folks who you are, South, sure. and tell them um, uh, what, what you're up to, what you do? Okay. So um, my name is South Cox. I am the owner and boyer of Stalker Stick Bows. So I'm the only one in the company. So when you call, email, Facebook, yeah. you know, whatever, um, I mean, everything, the buck stops here. So I do all the packaging of the bows, the building of the bows, um, all the, you know, handle everything from, from A to Z in the company. And I... Uh, um, I also write for Western Bowhunter and Elk Hunter Magazine. I'm a hunting editor for them. And uh, I've been involved on a professional level in the hunting industry for, I don't know, 20, 25 years, something yep. like that, roughly. I've been shooting a bow since I was about five years old. So it's been about 40 years now that I've been shooting a bow. And I've uh, been a lifelong hunter and I uh, have primarily just bow hunted my whole life. I had a 22 um, when I was younger that I'd small game hunt with and, and uh, um, a BB gun before that and, you know, slingshot and blow gun and, you know, anything, rocks, any, anything I could do to go out there and be a predator. <laughs> well, Mark and I met you at the Full Draw Film Tour School mm -hmm. about a year ago. And... Um, we were, I was really excited to meet you because I have heard about you, read about you, uh, followed your stuff for a long time. And um, one of the things that uh, I've always, uh, that has stood out with, with you <clears throat> is that you consistently kill a lot of big mule deer. Um, and and uh, I've done some mule deer hunting, stalking and stuff mm -hmm. with a bow. Not, not as much because in Oregon it, it uh, it's at the same time as elk hunting season, yeah. mm -hmm. and I kind of have this blacktail addiction as well. Right. So <laughs> during the rut, so I tend to focus on elk for September, and then I wait for the second season to kick in and then right. I chase blacktail during the tail end of the rut. So so I haven't done as much, but the mule deer hunting I have done has been 
a lot of fun, but it was a lot harder than, um, I mean, it was, it was different, I guess. I'm used to the forests of the sure. coastal Oregon or, or, and, uh, what I found, what I found myself doing in mule deer country was wide open and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So, but I wanted to get your ideas, uh, like how, get your information on how you do it, sure. how, how you're successful. I wanted to talk to you about why mule deer, why not elk, why not blacktail? Mm-hmm. You know, what is it about mule deer that just gets you going? Sure. So I, I actually started out um, hunting blacktails myself um, here in Northern California. I grew up in this area and they were, you know, the animal that was closest to me to hunt and mm-hmm. I didn't have to buy out of state, you know, hunting licenses or figure out the whole tag and draw system and all that. So it was a animal of opportunity for me. And uh, I started hunting, you know, public lands primarily because I didn't have a lot of uh, private land hunting connections. And then I, I love, you know, mount, the mountains, getting out there and, and uh, experiencing, you know, high mountains and being up at the top and up above tree line and like that. So I, I hunted the wilderness areas in California quite a bit and I uh, kind of really cut my teeth as a bow hunter hunting blacktails. And then um, in, I want to say it was 1987, I saw Larry Jones video hunting open country mule deer. And I was like, that is what I want to do. <laughs> why, why did you think that? Oh, it's just, I mean, it epitomized everything that I love, you know, the, the high mountains, yeah. you know, um, I, I liked hunting blacktails, but, um, blacktails, um, now that I've hunted mule deer for as probably as long as I've hunted blacktails, um, I think mule deer are a lot easier to hunt because of their their specific habits of that animal. Blacktails, you know, you may be able to see them in the morning and the evening out in the open feeding, but then they'll go into some dense, nasty brush patch to bed up, and uh, so you have, you know, you have a very short window of time in the morning and a very short window of time in the evening typically to kill a blacktail um, using spot and stock, which is the, the method that I prefer to hunt. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then occasionally you'll find them where they bed in a spot that you can, you can spot and stalk them in their beds, but it's by far, um, they're more likely to bed in a, in a spot that is, you're, you don't have an opportunity to, you, maybe you can get within 50 yards of them, but you know, getting any closer, you're gonna sound like a freight train going through yeah. you know, um, a, a briar patch. So mule deer, um, Larry Jones video was shot in Nevada where they're hunting above a tree line and these bucks are bedding under rocks and, you know, underneath a single tree and just incredible spot and stock opportunities. And I was like, man, that is all about what I want to do. And uh, it was going to be another decade before I would get to Nevada to be able to do that myself. But I hunted Oregon um, a year or two later and I... and got to do a limited amount of spot and stock. I was in the John Day area of central eastern Oregon. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it was you know, a lot more open than, than uh, a lot of country for mule deer, but it wasn't that classic alpine you know, experience. But it's yeah. still, I, I was successful. I shot my first mule deer um, on my first mule deer hunt and uh, got a taste of it, got bitten by the bug and um, did a little bit of hunting mule deer in Northern California, Northeastern California, where we have a narrow strip that runs along the Eastern part of the state where mule deer inhabit. And then we got hit by a bad winter kill in 92, 93 that knocked out, you know, 70, 80% of our mule deer and uh, effectively, you know, shut down mule deer hunting um, for all practical purposes in, in mm-hmm. California. And uh, so it wasn't until, I want to say it was 97, right in there, 98 maybe, that I hunted mule deer in, in Nevada for the first time and then really got hardcore hooked on mule deer. And for me, I, I just absolutely love spot and stock hunting. You feel like you know, a real predator um, and you're in control of your own destiny to a certain degree. Um, mm-hmm. you, know, you can decide which way you wanna go. You're planning a stalking route. It's kinda like a chess match, really. You know, and, and uh, well, even when you watch your video, uh, you know about you know stalkers in the backcountry. You know, uh-huh. that's what it looks like. You, literally, you're climbing this hill, and 
you can see you're mapping out your route and you know there's a mm -hmm. ditch here and a canyon here and a little brush here and if right. i go here 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 i can yeah. get in position the wind is right it, it yeah. is like a chess match it's battlefield strategy <laughs> you know a lot you know yeah. and, and uh that was always really intriguing to me and, and then also um the early season element i love you know i cold weather and me don't get along particularly well yeah. you know especially when you're living in a tent <laughs> and uh in if you hunt cold weather which i i mean i don't not too adverse to it but if you're going to backpack in somewhere and you're hunting late season man that's a lot more gear mm -hmm. everything's heavier you know and and uh, so that early season yeah beautiful weather um the animals are still in velvet and uh which that right there is a huge puts the advantage swings the advantage towards the bow hunter i think it's probably the biggest single thing if you can hunt mule deer during an archery season and hunt them in velvet the first you know say week of the season before they shed their velvet versus later in the season when they're hard horned the, the change the animals go through in their habits hormonal it's, shift and yeah it's amazing i mean it almost seems like when they shed their velvet they know hunting season's here we yeah. need to dive into the brush really? um, when they're in velvet their antlers are a little more tender um, so they're hanging out in more open country they also need to eat a lot more because their antlers are growing they need all those nutrients and and uh, so they're out feeding longer periods and uh, when, you know, when they're in the open, obviously they're easier to see. Yeah. When they're hanging out, um, bedding in areas where they're not gonna be banging their antlers, they're more conducive to be able, being able to stalk. So I always focus my efforts, if I can, on the first week of, you know, opening week of the season. And, um, and that's typically <clears throat> August, Generally August or September, depending on the state. Um, Nevada opens the 10th of August, which is really That's... nice because nothing else is open then. So right. if you're going to hunt multiple states and stay married, <laughs> 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 then you don't want to be gone necessarily for two straight hunts. It's nice to be able to hunt Nevada, you know, say August 10th through the 18th, yep. come home for a week, and then go back out again, say when yeah. Colorado or Oregon or some of the other later um, opening states open and then be able to get in a couple of great, you know, high country mule deer hunts. And that's, that's kind of why I like Sitka or yeah, you know, Sitka Blacktail, Blacktails. Mm -hmm. because I can go down there sure. to, to, to Alaska in August. Yeah. And, and, then... and Sitka Blacktail um, behave a little bit more like mule deer in yeah. during that time of year when they're still in they're velvet, still velvet and yeah and they're bedding up high in the alpine and that's the the really the the probably the closest experience i've had to what you're describing mm -hmm. and we're spotting them in the alpine meadows and stuff and yeah. then we're putting our sneak on them but up there it was like uh it's noisy the ground is like um there's these weird plants that grow that are like rubber Hmm. everywhere and you walk on it's like week week mm -hmm. week it was uh -huh. you know and that's one of the questions i want to get to later sure um when you talk about how you're successful mm -hmm. um i've seen you sometimes like go in your socks or yeah. go in like some you slip something on your on your foot uh, and yeah. sneak in there you know uh, i'd like to get your thoughts on that yeah i mean later. if you want we can touch on that now or later or kind of work from the top down the list there I've yeah got, i've got a question though like <laughs> sorry yeah I had. You, you can't know, ask. Foreigners. <laughs> I, I'm here legally and I have my green card to prove it. Okay, last night I had mule deer for the first time. Never uh -huh. before and you and your wife fed us a brilliant meal. I want to go hunt mule deer now, right? Uh -huh. What do I do to do the Nevada thing? Because I like to keep my marriage. Sure, you know. intact. Yep, yes. yep. Okay. Um, so Nevada... Um, Every unit for mule deer in Nevada, you have to draw a tag. Okay. Um, different units have different numbers of preference points. So every year that you put in for a unit and you do not draw your tag, you get a preference point. Okay, like so that means you don't get to hunt, but you get a preference point. Right. So some units take, some of the really good units might take 10 points to draw. Some of the lesser units might take one or two points to draw or three points or like that. Um, there, is, there are units that have leftover tags. So the way it works is, let's say you have 
50 tags in a unit for archery. Mm -hmm. Residents will get 45 of those tags, non-residents get five. So they get 10% of the available tags that non-residents do. If a unit is undersubscribed during the draw by residents, right. so let's say only 40 people put in for the residents, there's gonna be five leftover non-residents tags. Those go into a second draw, and then that draw happens later, like in July. And then both non-residents and residents can put in for that second draw. So then if you don't draw, let's say you don't draw on that first draw, you can put in during the second draw and maybe you'll get lucky and get one of those tags. Okay. There are units that are undersubscribed that you are able to, in the last couple of years, have even been undersubscribed after the second draw. So you've been able to buy a tag oh, over the counter. Yeah. yeah. So, yes. Yep. Oh, really? So that there's um, limited, li okay. those are limited, those opportunities, but they do exist. Okay. And with Nevada, you cannot apply unless you have your hunter safety uh, you have to submit it, I think, in the... Yeah, um, I think you have to have a... You, you oh. know, it's been so long. Mine are, mine are on record on the states that I've been putting in for, but I, I believe you're right that you have to have a hunter safety license. And it's like, different. Hunter safety like, card, yeah, rather. Yeah, I think... I don't remember what, the, what so it is. Have to look that up. Like I was you have to, like, mail it in <laughs> or something. There's some, it's a, a little extra step, because I have mine. I for can the apply first to Colorado and all this. Yeah. For the first uh -huh. year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little over than 12. Sure. Well, you can still do it. They have hunter safety classes. Yeah, yeah. Generally, you go to a sporting goods store, yeah. gun My store, or like that. Uh, going to go here really soon. Well, uh -huh. Maybe I'll go with your daughter. Yeah. There you go. So back on topic. Thank you, Mark. Sorry, sorry. Um, uh, so mule deer. Uh huh. Uh, so how do you kill them consistently year after year? Okay. So uh, there's a number of things. There's no golden key. Really, come but, on, Sal. What's, yeah. the, what's, the, what's the one secret? The, Turn off the camera. Right. <laughs> the atom bomb. <laughs> that pretty well That's annihilates them. It. Yeah. So there, there's a few things that, that I do on a consistent basis that I think help me um, fill tags where others may not. And um, one is that I try to get away from people wherever I can, other hunters. Um, and I do that by concentrating my efforts on wilderness areas and more specifically areas that are maybe less accessible within wilderness areas. Either they're farther away from a trailhead, maybe the trailhead is more remote and harder to get to. Um, maybe it's a unit in the state that just the geographic location, you have to drive further to get to it. Um, but at the same time, I'm also, I'm not just picking the most random, hard to place, hard to reach place. You also need to do your homework and make sure there's deer there. Right. And you're really only going to find that out through contacting the biologist in the game department. Um, but that's almost kind of a whole nother yeah. part about kind of doing your research. So assuming that I've found, you know, an area that holds good deer numbers, um, I'm looking for a spot um, that is, you know, I want to be eight or nine miles from the trailhead. A lot of guys will walk in three or four miles, but there's not a lot of guys that'll, that'll really put in that extra effort and go, you know, that, that really the eight, nine, 10 miles. And uh, so if you can get that far from the trailhead, you're going to leave a lot of people behind. And then when you do run into guys, most of the time, I don't know, I don't want to say most of the time, but a lot of the time they'll get back in there and they're going to be so burned out getting back in there. They may hunt for a couple of days and, and maybe they're not putting in a lot of effort. Maybe they're just walking out to the, you know, they're glassing from one place on the ridge and, uh, and then going back to their base camp. And then pretty soon they're packed up and they're out of there. So basically what you're saying is it's not for the faint of heart. No, it's not. It's really not. I mean, and I don't want to make it out like it's, you know, running an ultra marathon either. Um, it can feel like it by the end of a 10 day hunt, you can feel that beat up, yeah. but a lot of it is just really, it's mental toughness. I mean, you can, you can go out there and physically train your body, um, and be in fantastic shape. Um, and during that time, you're going to also be increasing your mental toughness, but it's also, there's a whole different capacity when you're up there on the mountain and you are by yourself 
or with a hunting partner, but your family's at home and you know your wife's you know, upset and your kids are upset because you're not there and, and then you're eating crappy food and, and uh, you know, your, it, your meals are getting monotonous because you're eating Mountain House night after night and you're having you know, instant oatmeal every morning and you'd kill for a hamburger on day two, <laughs> let alone day seven. And uh, uh, yeah. I'm describing an experience uh -huh. I'm familiar with. So, you know, all these little things start adding up. Maybe you're starting to, you know, feel a little lonely or homesick or you're realizing, geez, man, my work's mounting up, you know, piling up at work. And here I am. I haven't seen, you know, a good buck in four days. And man, it was, you know, my really, is this a wise use of my time? Right. You know, all these things start nagging at you. And then pretty soon you've talked yourself off the mountain and you're packed up and you're heading home. And that's what happens to a lot of guys. And yeah. you have to have a level of commitment that is higher than what the rest of the guys are going to have. I mean, you have to go, you know what, going into this hunt, there's going to be days when I feel like packing it up. I might get hit by a thunder shower and I left my rain gear on my, in camp or up at my tent or whatever, and I'm soaked to the bone and it's miserable. I'm hungry. I'm pissed off because I just missed a big buck, you know, and, or I blew one out for the third time today or, you know, something to that effect. And, uh, you just got to know the sun's going to rise tomorrow. If I put the, the miles on, I'm going to have more opportunities. And it's a positive attitude is another, another thing. Mental toughness, a positive attitude goes a long ways. And this uh, tenacity to just keep on going, you know, just don't give up and, uh, and keep after it. And that will, I can't tell you how many times that's made a difference for me. And another hunting partner of mine I hunted with, for a long time, I, I, I remember in, you always have the opportunity to swap stories and stuff and, and you know, when you're out hunting. And, and a good buddy of mine, um, he was on a 15-day solo doll sheep hunt. And he was um, seven miles from, oh, yeah. yeah. So he's up in Alaska, out in the middle of nowhere, got dropped off on a, on a, uh, um, with a Super Cub you know, on a, yeah. on a gravel airstrip somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. And then he backpacked seven miles from there up on the, you know, to the top of the mountains where he could hunt. And he's the last night of the last day of his trip. And 15 days of eating mountain house and carrying everything on your back and, you know, dealing with all the elements of Alaska. And this guy um, shot, hit, filled it, killed a, a ram on the last day. And then he had 21 miles to cover in 24 hours. So he had to go, he had to go from the top of the mountain all the way back to the airstrip, drop his meat, go back up. So that's seven miles, back up another seven miles, that's 14 miles, get his camp and then back down and drop his gear off. And uh, got back to the airstrip just as the Super Cub was coming in and landing. Okay. Yep. So there, there to me is a supreme example of mental toughness, right. physical preparation, and uh, and all of that coming together in a accumulation, accumulation of uh, you know of a successful hunt that most guys probably would have been on you know day seven using their sat phone to call in and I, I'm you know pull me out I'm going home, and uh, and yet this guy would continually fill tags and he would fill tags on day 17 of a day of a 10 day hunt where he had to stay an extra week, you know, and to make, to fill a tag rather than go home empty handed. I mean, it was, it was really a um, pretty neat learning experience for me on just how far mental toughness and tenacity will take you. So that, that's, so there's, what did I touch on? Um, getting away from, on the trail, you know, getting, getting in getting deep. Getting remote, getting mm -hmm. away from people. Yeah. Yeah. So attitude, po keeping a positive attitude, you know, that um, even when the chips are down, yep, right. all it takes is one break, one lucky break, and you're back in the ball game again. And it's something we talked about earlier. Um, you were saying glassing. Mm -hmm. So um, one, one more thing on that I want to touch on on the positive attitude is, mm -hmm. is I, uh, you can think of, um, if you think of hunting in terms of a baseball game, um, 
let's just say, you know, you're in the ninth inning and you're getting killed. You're, you know, 15 runs down and, uh, and you're going into the, the bottom of the ninth. And this may be the last, ev the last uh, um, evening of your hunt, the last day. And if you're playing baseball, that's, you're in a pretty hopeless scenario. Who gets 15 runs in one inning, right? right. Well, that 15 runs might be 15 blown stocks or 15, you know, blown shot opportunities. And assuming you still have an arrow left in your quiver, you're still in the game. Right. But all it takes is one hit to get you back on base, you know, and then you've won the game. Right. And yeah. so if you think about it in those terms, you may feel like you're in a hopeless situation. But in reality, you only need one stock to go right. I mean, you're you're the policeman versus the bank robber. The policeman only needs to nab that bank robber once, you know, to get him, and then he's he's out of out of business. Yeah. The baseball, you're one hit away from knocking. It yeah, apart. yeah. I mean, that's because really... that guy's going to remember that forever. Sure. Know? Well, I was going to say, you know, I think this 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 year, in fact. So Anthony has been trying to get a bull, help his dad shoot a bull for their whole life. You know, he's been with a bow, you know, and so a big bull. So he's out there and. This year, you know, they hunted the Wasatch. He drew a Wasatch tag in Utah, and he went up there, and they hunted the whole season. Um, and it comes down to, you know, are you going to hunt the whole season, or are you going to quit? Right. You know, are you going to, are you going to hunt till the last day, mm -hmm. or you're not? And it's or the last hour of the last day. Last day. Yeah. Right. And uh, we've done that so many times, and now our kind of thing is. Uh, it, it seems like we're cursed. We always shoot them on the last hour of the last day. Right. <laughs> and so it's like, well, you know, uh, and, but rather what I think it is, is it takes that kind of uh, tenacity mm -hmm. to be successful. Yeah. And w what I often see are guys will go out and they'll hunt for, they'll have a five day hunt or seven day hunt. They got to get back. They have vacation. Yeah. They have, well, it's not that they uh, came home early, but they quit hunting on day four, really. Right. I mean, they weren't, right getting up in the morning and they weren't staying out yeah. till dark or they weren't, weren't right. really going out. And so hunting till the last moment of the, of every, you know, every opportunity you have, it takes that to get, that's a big part of that success. I think. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and not just, you know, going through the motions of it, but actually putting in that effort, you know, not put, not doing a 60% effort on day four, you know, when you were at a hundred percent on day one, and then 30% on day seven, but you know, every day getting out there and putting in that effort because in reality, typically the further you get into the hunt, if you know, let's say you're camped right here and you're hunting this whole area you're hunting, and you're kind of in a bowl. Yeah. Or not even necessarily in a bowl, but this is just, this is the, the reach that you have right, right here and you're camped right here on day one, you're, you know, hunting here. This is all fresh country. Animals haven't been bumped. By day seven, you know, you've pounded this country. The animals know you're around. They know something's up. It's going to take 100% on day seven to increase your chances right. of killing something. Right. Whereas on day one, really, you could probably put in 30% and still get into animals. Right. So you're going to need to put in more effort the later you get into the hunt where most guys put in less effort you know, the further you get into the hunt. Okay, here's, here's something. Uh, your wife, we were talking last night and told some stuff, and she told me that you, you know, this concept that you're talking about, you don't just do this in hunting. This is in your lifestyle, right? Because she said to us that, that stuff happens to you, like your shop burned down and, and certain things happen to you. You just keep going, she mm -hmm. said. Hey? She said his yeah. attitude is just to keep going, right. you know? And you just keep going, keep going. So, yeah. well, yeah, there's a, um, I don't know where it came from in my life, but I've always looked at like something happens and I don't get down in my oats about it and, you know, cry in my milk or whatever, yeah. you know, it's. See, that's what my mom yeah. would say. Don't, you can't eat greet over spilt milk. Right. You can't, can't you, you can't, you can't eat greet. You can't eat greet, you can't eat cry over spilt milk. That's what my <laughs> granny used to say. You can't eat greet over spilt milk, get on with it, right? And that's right. the same thing, sure. isn't it? Yeah. So what it is, I mean, basically, that is wasted energy and wasted time. Yeah. And because, I mean, yeah, it sucks. My shop in August 1st, 2005, my shop burnt to the ground. I had 13 employees. 
and I had a shop with, you know, hundreds, well, I probably lost a quarter million dollars in one, one, one fell swoop. And my, my insurance had lapsed because my secretary hadn't renewed it. And so I should have been insured, but it didn't happen. So it was all out of pocket. And I was supposed to. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to bring up like that. Yeah, really Mark's bad. Scottish, uh, th- uh, upper you, oh, yeah. bugger. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, your so, wife's all, I would have just cried, but he kept going. Yeah, I mean, that was, I didn't have a choice. I mean, it was, you know, cry and die or keep <laughs> on going, you know. And, and I had a hunt that I was supposed to leave on in a week. And so I had basically, I, at first I was like, there's no way I can, you know, there's my shop just burnt down. There's no way I'm going to be able to go on this hunt. I mean, I slept so little bef- on, during that week, just totally stressed out, trying to get everything together, keep all my employees busy, ordering in new equipment, you know, um, getting another location for my shop, ordering materials that got burned up in the fire. You know, our computer system got burnt up. I mean, it was like, it was all kinds of yeah. havoc. And, I take um, a problem, no matter if it's a, you know, a splinter under my fingernail or if it's a, a fire that burns down my shop, and I look at that as an opportunity to find a solution. And I think it's that kind of attitude, not about, you know, oh my goodness, my life just crashed and is going to end, but it's, okay, now here's a problem. This is a puzzle. I need to solve it. Right. And so if you can kind of, if you can look at, at a, at a problem and and look at it in that manner rather than you know this is a life ending tragedy then I think that just looking at it as a challenge versus in that other manner right there you're ahead of the game okay. and uh, so I take that into all aspects of my life um, relationships are a little more challenging for me <laughs> did you go on the hunt yes yeah so I was, yep in fact I killed my my biggest buck I ever shot in Nevada on that trip. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, so it was, you know, I went into that trip ragged and totally haggard. I mean, it was kind of, it was kind of funny actually. I went on that trip with, I took my friend Cam Haynes on that trip um, into my spot. <clears throat> and um, we, uh, we packed in with horses. Um, the packer brought us in, brought all the gear in. And uh, mind you, I had, rolled into um, the trailhead at about one in the morning or something after driving all night. And, uh, um, you know, so I barely gotten any sleep driving, you know, or getting ready for the trip, then a few hours of sleep the night before. And so I was in miserable, you know, uh, physical and mental condition coming into this. So we got brought in, dropped all of our gear at a where I have a base camp established, and then we loaded up our bivy camps, and we were going to hike up to the top of this ridge. And uh, this was the day before the opener, and we were hiking up the top of this ridge, and we were less than a hundred yards from the top of the ridge, and I was done. I mean, I bonked, and there was no getting. I mean. It was pathetic. <laughs> yards. Yeah, it was literally a hundred <laughs> yards or less to the top of the ridge, and I, I just—I mean, I was like, I'm, I'm yeah. done, you know. I mean, I was one of those sit down and battle, you know. I'm gonna get killed, but I'm over, you know. And I, trying to find scratch out a you know spot to sleep on a hillside <laughs> like this, but it was there was just no me getting to the top. And Cam's like, really? <laughs> I mean, he's like, what on it's earth intense. did we? Yeah. And the funny part was, is, is, uh, um, <laughs> I can just picture that 100 yards from the top, and it's like, really? I mean, yeah. You know, you know, come come on, dude. And I'd hunted with Cam before, and so he yeah. knew that, you know, this was a little out of character for me. But still, I had sent Cam an email. We were filming this hunt for Eastman's, yeah. and I. Uh, and I told him, I said, you better make sure that the cameraman either is in incredible shape or has a burning desire to keep up. So I'm sitting here watching them hike up the last hundred yards, eating crow, like beyond eating crow. I mean, it, it was beyond ridiculous, you know. So the next morning, 
I got a, um, Cam shot a, a nice buck, like a, a 165 class four by four, beautiful buck. Yeah. And then, uh, and the funny thing is, is um, I, the next morning I got up. And you sneak down that, that yeah. hill and you take that, it's a long shot, wasn't it? Uh, no, my shot was only 25 yards, maybe, something like that. You just snuck right up on it. Yeah, yeah. The camera angle, he was set up and, you yeah. know, above me. And, but uh, anyway. Like dust flies. Right. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that was a pretty cool. It was a cool setup. shot. Mm -hmm. I, I liked the video. Yeah. yeah, it came out well. But uh, on, that, on that hunt, um, the next morning I got, you know, got up and carried. Um, oh, to make matters worse. Dang mosquitoes were on me, so I barely slept that night anyway. I'd have been better off just, you know, sitting down, resting for a little while, then getting up and going. And I, the, at the top, there was a wind blowing over, so the mosquitoes weren't bad. But where I was, I was sheltered out of the wind, so I got hammered by mosquitoes. They were fine up there on top. But anyway, the next morning, um, I left my backpack on top. I'd spotted a bomber, like 190 class buck, and I was watching this buck. And uh, all of a sudden, it got kind of edgy like this and was looking all alert. And then I realized Cam and the cameraman um, were like within 150 yards of this buck. And they were stalking a group of bucks that was down further in the, the canyon. They never saw that big buck, oh, wow. but they ended up going right by this big buck. So I left all my gear at the top of the um, ridge and took off after this big buck. I didn't realize it, but they had all of their gear with them. They had loaded up their camp and took off and dropped into the bottom. Well, Cam had made a, um, a marginal hit on this buck, and so we spent the day blood trailing it. Finally, um, recovered it right before dark, and uh, and Your gears and my gear's on the top of the mountain. <laughs> and now we're you know half a mile or more from where my camp is. And so that night I, I slept out, and uh, fortunately Sean had a jacket, extra jacket with him, and his space blanket but i slept in a space blanket and a jacket and uh so it was not a fun night yeah. that night that was a i think that's the only night that i can no i i this last year in colorado i slept out without my sleeping bag also um but in any case i later i ended up killing a nice buck and and uh, a couple days later it was a nice buck. yeah so anyway so we're um we're getting deep um, positive attitude, and what was the third one that we had touched on? Um, mental toughness, yeah, maybe. Um, so now getting down to maybe some more of tactics, um, and I'll touch on the glassing part, but one of the things I wanted to talk about was um, terrain and topography more, yeah, yeah, more yeah. particularly, um, more specifically. So, you know, everyone... You want to find an area where, particularly if you're a traditional bow hunter, that there's uh, good deer quantities because you're going to need opportunities. Opportunities equals, you know, eventually, hopefully, success. And if there's not very many deer, that means fewer opportunities, means a lower chance of success. And uh, so your natural inclination would be to, you know, go where there's the most deer. But what I look for first is an area that has um, what I call micro topography in that, um, you know, not only is there going to be good, you know, mountain ranges, ridges like that, somewhere where we can get up high and prominent and glass into cover, you know, large expanses of area. But within that country, it's not going to be smooth rolling hills where, you know, maybe there's deer piled in there, but it's like hunting on the surface of the moon where, you know, just getting into 100 yards would be a challenge, let alone getting into, you know, 15 yards. So I'm looking for a country that has a lot of, you know, more angular, broken up, you know, ridge lines or channels, ditches, rock outcroppings, bushes, you know, anything like this that can give me an edge where I'm watching this buck either you know, where he's up feeding or where he goes and beds down. And then there's cover that I can use, um, a roll of the hill. You know, there's a lot of times when I'm glassing into, um, a, on a, onto a ridge or a bowl or something that looks like, it's like, there's no way, you know, they're just, 
that deer you know, might as well be on the moon for as safe as it is. And then you start picking it apart with your binoculars and you're looking at it. And it can be challenging when you're looking across a canyon to pick out subtle rolls and folds right. in topography. But if you really sit there and study it and go, okay, that deer's bedded here, but just above them, you know, 20 yards above them, there's a little bit of a, a hump in the ground. And if I come in from this angle here, then that hump is going to hide, you know, hide him behind it. And I can get up and pop up like that. And I'm going to be within bow range at that right. point. And that to me, probably more than anything has made the biggest difference for me in, in my success in the field is that looking for that micro topography and setting up stocks where I've got a boulder that if I come in behind this boulder and keep it in line, or if I come down this ditch or I belly crawl behind this sage bush or what have you, it's using that, that um, those geographic um, features to, to help um, hide me. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and I've noticed when I watch films that you're in. All right. This is it for this episode of the Gritty Bowman podcast. Pardon our blunders and please stay tuned for the next episode with our guest, South Cox. Uh, yeah, we had a brilliant time with South. We can't thank him enough for taking the time to share his passion uh, for archery in the outdoors. Um, and we have some great footage of South building and shooting his bows. We plan to give you an inside look into South Cox, the boyer, the hunter, and the man. Stay gritty. <laughs>